we're going to discuss a little bit more about what we know about the atom. A quick review of our understanding of the atom. It was the Greeks who first proposed the idea that matter was quantized. In other words, if you were to take a piece of gold and you're a bar, for example, and cut that bar in half, and then you took that half of bar and cut that bar in half, and then continue to keep, take each halves and cut, continue to cut them in half, eventually you're going to get down to one fundamental part that can no longer be subdivided. That's how the Greeks first viewed what the atom was. But in the year 1897, a guy with a really cool last name discovers the electron. What J.J. Thompson did was he set up a cathode ray tube where a beam was fired onto a fluorescent screen where an electric field that is directed upward would cause the beam to be deflected downward. When the electric field was then directed downward, the beam would be deflected upward. This had um, the properties of a negative charge. And it was Thompson who believed that there was there, the electron must be a um, smaller component of the atom. So as a result, he developed one of the first models of the atom past the, the Greeks. And he called it the plum pudding model. This is actually what plum pudding looks like, believe it or not. It's, it's apparently it's an English delicacy. It's by the way, it's neither plum nor puddings. It's raisins in a cake. But what what Thompson envisioned was the electrons were evenly distributed throughout a sphere of positively charged goo, if you will. Um, if you don't like that analogy, think of um, watermelon seeds inside of a watermelon, where the seeds are the electrons and the red stuff that you eat is the positive charge. This model was seriously flawed, however. And this guy said so. His name was Ernest Rutherford. And you probably recall the famous gold foil experiment where a beam of alpha particles, which were known to be positively charged, were fired at a very thin film of gold. The alpha particles, for the most part, were passed through the gold foil as if it wasn't even there. Um, so 99% of the alpha particles were passing through the gold foil. Only 1% of the time, however, the alpha particles were deflected um, in random directions, and sometimes the alpha particles even bounced back um, off of the gold foil. This led Rutherford to develop his own model of the atom. He concluded that the atom was mostly made up of empty space because of the fact that the alpha particles were passing through the atom undeflected. He figured that the only reason for the alpha particles being deflected backwards is they must have encountered the positively charged nucleus and that the electrons that were discovered by J.J. Thompson must still be there but must be in an orbit around the positively charged nucleus. Um, similar to how planets orbit around the sun. But there were some significant problems with the Rutherford model. For one, according to classical laws of physics, electrons that are in orbit or that are moving in circular paths should be emitting electromagnetic energy. An accelerated electric charge is what generates electromagnetic energy. So if an electron is in orbit, that means that it's constantly changing direction. It should be emitting electromagnetic energy and thus be giving up its own energy, which would cause the electron to slow down and ultimately spiral into the nucleus. And that doesn't happen. But the other problem with the Rutherford model of the atom was that there was no apparent reason for why electrons couldn't have just any radius. They, like planets are, that orbit around the sun can be at any distance from the sun. But electrons, as we find, have found out, have to be at specific inter, uh, distances from the nucleus. And it also contradicted the experimental evidence of spectral lines. I'm sure that 
maybe back in chemistry, you looked at different elements um, through a spectroscope, and you would see that each element had its own unique atomic spectral lines that was that gave information about what the element was made out of. Rutherford's model of the atom couldn't explain that. So that's where Danish physicist Niels Bohr suggests that the electron does orbit the positively charged nucleus. However, if it's in its lowest energy level, its ground state, the electron does not emit energy. It is only when the electron absorbs energy and is raised to a higher energy level that where the electron jumps up to a higher energy level but doesn't want to stay there for very long so then the electron drops back down to its lower energy state giving up a photon of energy. This is basically the orbiting electron um, has discrete quantized energy. The, the electrons can only exist in specific orbitals according to the Bohr model of the atom. So classical laws of mechanics do not apply for electrons that orbit around the nucleus. In other words, they don't radiate energy. They have different sets of rules for them at an atomic or a quantum level. When the electron makes a jump from one orbit to another, the difference is carried off in a single quantum of light, a photon, which has energy equal to the energy level difference between the two orbitals. Bohr model was very, very good at explaining very simple atoms like hydrogen and helium and lithium, ver atoms that had very small numbers of electrons. But when we started talking about more complicated atoms, then the Bohr model of the atom didn't um, pr make predictions very well. So this is where the cloud model of the atom was then introduced by Erwin Schrodinger, um, that the electron has to exist in a cloud or a region of space where there's a high probability of its location. So basically what we're saying here is that we understand that the atom is best described as um, a probability function of where the electrons exist. Um, this is our best understanding of the model of the atom currently. So finally I'll leave with you We've, we've evolved from understanding that the atom, the Greek model of the atom, then led to the Thomson model of the atom, which then led to the Rutherford model, and then the Bohr model, and now the quantum mechanical model. So what's next? Is it possible that there is something that we have yet discovered? It is very possible.